squat scorn this video is sponsored by squarespace the antoine dupont of website builders in 2019 they were outsiders 18 months out from kickoff in Japan, a South African World Cup win looked as likely as in 87. The former champ had been counted out, written off, labelled as a has-been whose glory days were behind them. It sounds like a Kevin Costner part, but the story of the 2019 Springboks really is one of rugby's great fairy tales. The worst Springbok side ever evolving into a beautiful bunch of world beaters. A diverse roster of players drawn from every corner and creed of the Rainbow Nation, united by adversity and one genius coach who combined empathy with adding opposition players to an endangered species list. South Africa smashed their way into the final through power, pace, and when faced with a world side leaving nothing out there, sheer force of will. And once they arrived in Yokohama with only England in their way, destiny took over. It was the hero's journey, the monomyth, the classic story. Robert McKee turning up in the changing room to congratulate Razzie on how clean his narrative was. Only Atoje kept his eyes dry as Sia Khaleesi completed the prophecy Mandela put in place 24 years beforehand. The sequel, however, has been a little bit messier. The underdog title is gone, but not replaced with a favourites tag, as mixed results sports shaking controversies, injury crisis and a hell of a lot of Covid fallout, including a complete reshuffle of the domestic season, have built a Springbok side it's tricky to quantify. And so, on the brink of a fascinating rugby championship, and just a small leap away from a World Cup itself, it's time to dig in and ask the big question. With everything that's gone on in between in the last four years, can South Africa retain the Rugby World Cup. When the draw was done for this World Cup back in 1826, it was already pretty clear. South Africa had landed themselves in the trickiest pool of the lot. Ireland, Scotland, Tonga, Romania. Yet this draw has only gotten tougher since. The Erasmus Nine coaching ticket has always been beautifully subtle in their tactics and management, but when it comes to team talks and laying down a challenge, they shoot so straight you'd think someone had broken the R stick on their controller. No mind games or subterfuge, just a gauntlet the size of Namibia dropped on the floor. This is how we play, come and beat us. The only problem is, over the last two years, opponents have start taking them up on that challenge. France, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia, even bloody Wales, able to call their bluff. The start of this Springbok dynasty had an invincible air. Even in the games they lost, they were the worst team to face, the one you hated coming up against most, the hardest team to beat worldwide. By the time Nick White bought a yellow card off a referee with the most shit-stained five-bob note you'll ever see, that feeling had pretty much gone. So it's worth digging into what happened, why, and whether this affects the chances to attain the crown. There's been a lot of talk the last 18 months about the Springbok style of play stagnating, which I think is both spot on and a little bit, not far, wider the mark. In Razzie's first few years in charge, and even after he handed the reins over to his baldy buddy Jacques, which means friend with no hair and Welsh slang from the mid-noughties, South Africa played a very detailed but direct set of tactics within a loose yet strict system. The objective was always to be moving forward, momentum was more important to Erasmus's mind than possession or even territory, so if the box went four or five phases ever without making notable ground, they set up to kick, they hung it in the air. So the opposition would always be backtracking, such as here. The clerk or Pollard hangs it, the winger contests, but even if the opposition beats them to it in the air, they're on the defensive. With the kick hung shallow and the chase given ample time to set, rival fullbacks found themselves trapped. All kick run past channels are shut off, and the only option is either get smashed or maybe do one step and get smashed by someone else. It allows South Africa to just keep the pressure on always momentum always with them regardless of who had the ball. Defence becomes a form of attack granting the box both territory and a massive psychological squeeze. And South Africa have continued doing this. They've continued doing it extremely well. Last year's statement win at Twickenham was mostly won in the scrum and in the air. This is a perfect example. England knocked them behind the game line for a phase so LaRue slips back into the pocket and hangs this kick. Now we can beat with Pimpy to it but he's turned his back in the process allowing Khaleesi to just devour him. And even once he offloads, Dear Landy can smelt Billy Vanapola, allowing South Africa to then turn the ball over the following phase, with the English forwards backtracking so hard to try and get back to try and cover two spaces at once. Even Freddie Stewart had an uncharacteristically poor game under the high ball, with the box applying such a brilliant squeeze, the way only the smartest tacticians with a bunch of 38 foot 9 mates can manage. This is essentially plan A, and it works. It works bloody 
well. We know that for a fact. However, the question marks aren't so much over plan B, but the phases between Hondra's hoofing within that plan A. Because that's exactly what we've seen Razzie and Jacques start to evolve. And it was, of course, a change inspired by, um, you'd be surprised to hear this, Squarespace. A long-time subscriber to the internet's favourite website builder, Razzie Rasmus was constantly telling people how much easier it is to use Squarespace than any other website builder in the world, to the point his lifelong best friend, Jacques Nineber, moved back to Ireland in order to get away from his constant pestering. But then Razzie showed Jacques Squarespace's new Fluid Engine, a next-generation design system. The Fluid Engine somehow made it even easier, even bloody easier, even with load shedding, to customise every detail with a drag-and-drop interface, dynamic features, just as usable on desktop or mobile in case of load shedding. And upon hearing this, nine of his eyes lit up, signing up to create a blog about his Dublin adventure to come, and that glorious innovation inspired him to make some tweaks to the system he was already perfecting himself. So if you want to explain all this for your very self, with or without load shedding, please head to the link in the description and use the offer code Squidge Rugby to save yourself some money. So, to dig into what's changed as South African attack, let's just look at where it was before, because it's always been incredibly direct. They would essentially play with nine forwards, Tammy and Ilande regularly most of the time slotting into the forward pattern to create a 1-3-3-2 attack formation, each number representing a group of forwards. One, usually Khaleesi or sometimes Dutoy, positioned on the wing as an edge forward, as they're known, with two primary tasks. If the box go wide and a carry needs making or a ruck needs securing by someone built less like a pint glass than Kurtley Aronser, up steps Seer and two, when they do kick, he's in place to smash the catcher or the ruck and look to win the ball back. The other forwards, the seven of them plus Dialande, then split up into three groups. Two of three players, one of two players. This would group the team's biggest ball carriers together, meaning they never isolated in contact. The forwards regularly worked around the corner, meaning the group would come from the far side of the ruck, so they're only entering the defender's eye line last second. And look, if you were just going about your day and an Ebenezer Beth ran at you and screamed, Tackle me! You'd probably let them win a World Cup as well. The two free pods alternate, but one always remains first out from the ruck, near the ruck itself, a kind of smash-up safety blanket. The structure allowed the box to remain united, never isolated, and never over-committing bodies. Everyone always gifted enough support to create an amazing level of ball retention. The backs would then play far looser off the momentum this generates, with LaRue and Pollard splitting playmaking duties between them, along similar lines. LaRue managed the shape of the attack, with Pollard in control of the tactics, deciding when to kick, run, or pass, or randomly smash it up himself. However, since the end of the last Lions tour, in 2021, this has begun to change. South Africa have adopted a fresher, livelier new system, joining Japan, Ireland and formerly Wales and Australia, in the wonderful world of the 1-3-2-2. Designed as a means of getting go forward from a lighter, more dynamic pack, using their footwork, acceleration and angles of running instead of raw bulk, it signals the start of a new strategy from South Africa, as they attempt to add more deception to their incredible power game, without moving away from it. However, the results have been... not bad, but... A little bit mixed. The three heaviest carries are still grouped together in the middle with one player on the wing, usually Khaleesi still, but the other four forwards are positioned wider, often amongst the backs, yet still paired with another forward so they won't get isolated. All of them now looking to hit angles and run lines, either off nine or ten, instead of just smashing it up the middle. This is a perfect example of what they're trying to accomplish. Previously, these three forwards would have just been positioned as one stodge together so they can just crash up for some easy meters, but instead Kitchoff has turned the head of the pod position into a kind of pseudo fly half roll, drawing McWright here with the two forwards on his shoulder then coming from depth instead of just hovering right next to him as before, four allowing them to pick angles and in this case exploiting how hard Lola Seo here is folding so Cock can storm through and feed Quagga for the score. It relies on the intelligence and instincts of the forwards, something demonstrated perfectly in this example. With the three-man safety pod having smashed it up, previously Marx would have positioned himself here alongside these two to make a second group of three here, but instead he's now in a wider position, allowing them to adapt to the situation, how the Argentine defender set up. The two groups slide into one flat four-man backline, De Klerk's mispass, skipping half the Argentine defence and allowing Marx and Forey to straighten and give. Mapimpi burning Cabelli on the outside and putting Mal Welcome in the corner. He should have taken under the post. The forward's added dynamism also allows the box backs to play in wider channels. Here, Khaleesi hits an angle to get on the front foot, and it allows the springbok backs to flood the far side. Five of six backs in a 50-meter channel, interplaying, handling the ball between them, all the way to get a try for Kurt the Aronser. The kind of score that wouldn't have been possible before because the backs would have been relied on to hold shape across the width of the field because the forwards were far more static. However, despite a fundamental shift to the core basics of their game, the reason nobody noticed and is crediting the springboks for their 2022 reinvention is really simple. Old habits die 
hard. And a fair few times we've seen the Springboks accidentally seep back into what they were doing before. Here against Ireland, the box have two pods of runners, but the moment the tackle comes in, both pods enter at once, meaning four Springbok forwards are now off their feet, with three having been involved in the previous phase, meaning there's only one on their feet, leaving the attack one body more depleted than it would have been under the old system, because they're still adapting to it. A more involved example of the pros and cons can be found here against England. Diolande crashes up to set a platform off the scrum and allow the forwards to get into their new shapes, and the cloak instantly he goes blindside. Scooting in the hope Moster will pick this diagonal line off him and instead of running straight as per the old system it wants him picking an angle. Flanker Franco is kind of apprehensive but because Faf puts him on the right path he makes great yardage coming up against the grain of the English fold and Umbanambi is in place to clear out. However Tom Curry does a fantastic job of slowing this ball down so Nshe steps in and South Africa reset with a standard pod of the three biggest carriers. Here's Roos, Mahoba and Etzebeth and it gives them such quick ball to play off. Except this is where things get a little bit tricky and we start to see some of the big knock-on effects because Tom Curry's challenge if we go back a bit has a big big impact on what the Springboks can do with this attack because it pulled one extra player into that ruck a phase later Willem here finds himself with one forward on his shoulder here instead of two which means if they carry they're probably getting isolated so Tuolangi here in the English defence can look up see Ori on his own know he's probably not going to get the ball because of that it'd be an immediate turnover threat recognise there isn't a second crash up option for Willem so his only option is to go out the back Tuolangi then flies up for whichever of LaRue or Diolande is going to get it to try and hit them hard. Willemstar identifies he's about to throw a hospital ball so takes it himself leaving Tulangi gutted that he won't have company when he inevitably ends up in the infirmary later that night. With shape loss South Africa go for the safety blanket of three big smash up lads again except because they now only have one group they're going to the lads that just carried Malherba who I think is fair to say is the least dynamic carrier in that spring rock pack was the first one back to his feet because he was only clearing out so he's forced to carry himself and from here it all starts to get a bit ugly. Diolande carries out of necessity and the two playmakers each spot a very different way out of the situation. LaRue sprints to organise another attacking shape on the blind side here but Willemse just drops into the pocket and I love this. He nails a lovely drop goal to put the box into the lead. This is the kind of tactic that we could see them starting to adopt more of taking drop goals if things aren't quite going according to plan. I love it as an option. It feels like a stagnant attack that goes nowhere over five metres the same as they were doing in 2019 before they kicked it but the reality is it's a far more involved exciting attack that's just having a lot of teething difficulty and if the Springboks can hit drop goals to get out of that, I love that as a plan B, as a backup plan. However, the new structure has also changed Damian Diolande's role. No longer a night forward, the box now want droplets of playmaking from rugby's hottest meatloaf, as the shape works best when there's an extra pair of hands to bring runners onto the ball. Ideally, they want both him and the pollard able to do it, with LaRue still able to set shape from wider out and slot in to give important passes. Yet the box also kind of want DDA to be able to muck in as a forward when necessary, and this occasionally leads to some confusion in the ranks. The box run England's line here and when Willemser gets pulled in to secure the ball, necessity, fine it happens, Diolande has to step into the fly half roll with LaRue as a second playmaker in his boot. Except, noticing South Africa only have two in the pod close to the ruck, instead of ordering Etzebeth here in, Diolande instinctively sprints in to be the third dude and clear out because that has been his role for years, the entire time under Razi Erasmus and John Nineber, this has been what he's been asked to do. It's not a bad decision and his clear out in the ruck is brilliant and gives South Africa a secure ball and they've done the hard job of contracting the English defence thanks to them all and then his quick phase. LaRue has slid up to 10 but with Etzebeth now having to slot in his ascent instead of Diolande the attack doesn't have any width. LaRue doesn't really have any option to get it wide but there's nobody in a realistic position around him to distribute despite the contracted defence. He knows if Mapimpi here gets the ball he scores so LaRue goes for a risky cross kick but the bounce beats Makazole. This is all a knock-on effect from Damien Diolande being asked to play so many roles. It's possible once the Candy Am's back from injury the box will ask him to play a little bit more of a playmaking role to free Diolande up but at the minute there's just little bits of teething trouble being aired in big matches for the box when it comes to this new attacking pattern. Changing a structure you've been running for four years is always going to take time and the box backroom staff were incredibly smart to make these amendments very slowly. They used the new structure exclusively between halfway and the opposition 22 in 2021 one, but would snap back to the old way in high pressure areas of the field where it mattered most. They've kept the kicking and pressure tactics identical though I'd be fascinated to see if they change anything in the rugby championship so they're not stuck in the new system ever they've always got something to fall back on that they're very used to and they've also been very willing to just snap back to the old way if they need to. It's something they did really effectively against France last year when he reduced to 14 after Peter Steftatoy got red carded. They just went back the way they've been playing for years without any focus on the new attacking rugby style they were trying to play. The bot kick pressure tactics 
tactics are tried, tested and effective. I'd expect them to remain the core of the Springbok strategy leading into the World Cup. They'll keep playing largely broadly the same identity of rugby, but Nineveh has been slowly building a more attacking plan B within the plan A, which is especially important when we consider the aforementioned challenges being accepted by their fellow World Cup contenders. Watching Wales, generally, the last few years has felt a bit like shitting on all your clothes and then heading to a wedding, yet they've consistently been the team the box have found it toughest to beat because Cymru are stubborn. Stubborn enough to play the perfect counter to the Springbok kicking tactics. It's no fun, includes literally no self-expression, and requires incredible patience, but if you're willing to front up, take the tackles coming in, manage them all, and basically replicate the kicking tactics, you can cancel the Springbok out just by hoofing the lever off it, sticking it in the air constantly, and not allowing them to gain the momentum because you're instantly pressing them back. It just becomes this very dull back and forth. Ireland did a great impression of that last autumn, shutting down the usual free-flowing quick-pass bullshit that they play in favour of a new slower steadier game apart from one moment where it opened up and they were able to take a chance because Wales had shown even a decidedly average team like themselves can challenge the Springboks if they have an insane level of tactical discipline and a solid enough hard nose enough pack. Doesn't matter if they're powerful, they basically just need to be belligerent. Developing a strong attacking game which they can switch on and off could be vital for South Africa in tight games, just as it was in that first test last year when Dewey Lakes try put Wales level with tiny amounts of time left on the clock. This more expansive game managed by LaRue got the box back into the position to win a penalty, which Willemse then slots over to net a hard fought win. All thanks to them being able to lean on this new attacking style of rugby that they'd started practicing. The attacking issues last year feel like eggs being broken so a beautiful omelette could be put on the menu this autumn. However, I think the real reason that there were so many teething issues last year wasn't so much that South Africa were shifting tactics, but when they were doing it. We'll never know what this World Cup cycle would have looked like without COVID if it didn't hit when it did, but I'm not sure the rugby world at large has quite dug into the full impact an entire year without playing a single match has had on South Africa as a rugby team. The season after a World Cup is always weird. It's a bit like all test competitions count for a little bit less as everybody attempts to rebuild. Coaches have moved on, players have retired, and perhaps most importantly, new trends begin to emerge as said players and coaches start to work out their style of play. The next year gives them another chance to blood players, build depth, tweak and change things in that game plan and that identity. Then when year three begins, you attempt to narrow your field, identify what's worked or if you're Ireland, peak. The fourth year, you then look to put it all together, trying to time your own right to win the whole bloody thing in September, October. The Springbok 2019 to 2023 World Cup cycle looked rather different to that. In 2020, they didn't play a single test. In fact, with the collapse of Super Rugby, their players not based in Europe found themselves struggling to get game time at all until the very end of the year. In 2021 came a British and Irish Lions tour, a once in a generation event and the second highest intensity environment in the sport after the World Cup's knockouts. Something they had to put a huge amount of focus on. And then in 2023, a World Cup after a truncated championship, meaning 2022 was the only year of normal rugby the Springboks received during the entire cycle. And as such, four years of rebuilding work got crammed into only 14 months. This goes for both the game plan that I've talked about, these changes having to take place very quickly, and up against teams who've had three years of rebuilding and restructuring where they've only had a few months, but also beyond that. The box used 48 players last year, handing out 11 debuts. They had a year's worth of game time to make up for, and this meant chucking a few youngsters in a bit deeper than they perhaps would have liked given an extra year of fixtures. More of these paid off than not. Aaron Sir and Moody were instant success on the wing and Jaden Hendrickson was a big bag of pros and cons when he first came in in his first couple of games yet finished the term a phenomenal deputy to the clerk thanks to being exposed to so much test match rugby that he genuinely got the chance to improve game on game they kept chucking him in until he really really worked because there was a raw talent there however there were the likes of Manny Lebarque, Ivan Ruse and Shuno who absolutely have the talent and that was evident but weren't really bedding in yet they perhaps need a little more time to adapt to the top level and it'd be fascinating to see whether South Africa continue trying to make up for lost time so close to the World Cup and bludging those players and building further depth or settle for the gems they were able to uncover during last year's 12-month raid because it leaves South Africa in a really unclear position. A team of their quality is never going to be worrying about a pool of death, but a group that now contains the world number one and six nations champions, an improving box of try machines now with a really impressive defence and game management, Finn Russell does that now, a Tonga team bolstered by about 8,000 former All Blacks and this dick, and a rejuvenated Romanian team with a fearsome pack and an incredible rolling mall that's made them a kind of mini spring box if they had a big phase of being into lemons, is a 
at least the pool of very strong cold. The Springboks are heading to this World Cup with one of the strongest squads, some of the best coaches, and a weird perfect hybrid of pressure off, no real expectation of them to win it, yet a huge, huge fear and respect from every single opponent they'll come up against. Yet they'll face the hardest draw imaginable. Ireland, Scotland, and France or New Zealand. And that's just to reach the semi-finals, which is kind of par for any Springbok team. The narrative is nowhere near as clean as last time. Teething problems, a race against time to blood players, not to mention the massive gamble is pissing off near enough every referee in world rugby, all compete with the raw ability of this team and their remarkable coaching group. It's a push and pull battle that makes South Africa fascinating protagonists without necessarily being the hero that we know is destined for greatness. However, if I just let myself give in to my gut for a moment, I feel South Africa will decide this Rugby World Cup. They may not emerge champions, but the seeding, the spread of power across the competition to me says the Springboks might just be kingmakers. Their path to the final is more demanding than a spell as Franz Stein's dietrician, but their fixture list grants prime opportunity to add chaos to the competition. They can knock out or derail the momentum of every single major contender along the way. If South Africa can defeat Ireland in the opening ball encounter, some lighter green wheels may just fall off. If they can knock out France or New Zealand in the quarters, it may blow the competition wide open. It, it will, in fact. And if anybody does knock them over, I think the mere act of beating the Springboks will require so, so much from literally every team in this competition. A mere six-day turnaround with the same intensity might not be possible heading into a semi or a final. In 2019, the Springboks were a fairy tale team, parachuted from nowhere to the highest high. And whilst they might not be the outsider this time, the path to the title might just require a little bit more than destiny. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm trying to do one of these on every team in the World Cup that starts in September. Uh, there's one on Romania, one of the Springboks World Cup opponents you may not know much about. Please go and have a look. They've got fascinating, really interesting history. One on Ireland, one of the other real contenders. Please go and have a look at that. There's going to be more coming forward. One on Portugal, a real World Cup contender, I've been led to believe. Um, with Argentina, the rugby champion coming as well. Going to try and have a look at that, but might not be able to manage to cover it in the same deep as in another year where there's not bloody loads of teams from a World Cup to get through. Otherwise, I'll see you soon for more Rugby um, Union. Nice to meet you. All right. Oh, bring it in, bring it in. <laughs> Starting from the bottom, now we're here. Yeah.